So with that, I'd like to call for the first paper, which is by our co-chair, Mark Boslow. Thanks, Al. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, this has been a great meeting so far. I've really enjoyed it. So I'm going to talk about uh, risk assessment uh, with the primary focus uh, being on small NEOs and air bursts. Um, risk assessment, of course, is a, is a key element of this enterprise. Uh, being able to quantify that in some sense uh, justifies our work in this area. Um, it can be the basis of, of a cost-benefit analysis. Of course, the benefit is reducing the risk and potentially saving lives. Um, as we uh, progress in this uh, business, um, the, the discoveries uh, have been focused mostly on the large asteroids. And, and as you'll see, um, the, the surveys have gone to about 90% completion on the large one, uh, the large asteroids greater than a kilometer in diameter, which dominate the risk, or which initially dominated the risk in the early risk assessments. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Peter Brown, who couldn't make it to the meeting, but Al Harris, who's up here as my co-chair, um, and you heard from him earlier in the week in his update of the population of asteroids, uh, which is a key element of this. Uh, let's see. Got to find the right button here. Sorry. There we go. So um, this is, uh, you, you've already seen this. This is a map that shows the small airbursting bolides for the last 20 years or so. This graph was just released uh, last November. Um, and, and there's, of course, been a couple years of bolides since then that are going on the JPL website live. Um, those are uh, released in the sense that we actually know the um, time um, of the event, the coordinates of the event, and the yield, the estimated yield of the event. So far, this data set of about 500 events, all the details are, have not yet been released. We're still waiting for this. Uh, but only the map has been released. Uh, but one of the things uh, we are doing uh, is plotting these in a way that's uh, in, in, in some way more intuitive for people to understand the relative size of these. If you look at this uh, map, here's the, here's the uh, key here in energy in gigajoules, um, but it's on a logarithmic scale, so you really can't tell by looking at this how much bigger Chelyabinsk is compared to the other ones, in fact, it's bigger than all the other ones put together. I'm not sure exactly how, by how much. Um, there's a, because this is a, the population is a power law, and so inherently the biggest ones are very much like all the other ones beneath them put together. Um, we have, uh, I, I've worked with uh, Brad Carvey, who is our um, visualization guru, and he has put together this uh, video um, that, we're attempting now to, to, to show relative size and we're continuing to work on this and we're, we've got it set up so that when everything else is released we can put in the full, um, the full uh, 20 or so years. Um, to, to, but to try to make them look um, uh, properly big relative to one another and we also have a soundtrack that goes with this. Um, so I want to say a few words about how we do probabilistic risk assessment and this really cuts across fields. Um, the same kind of techniques. Um, this was first done in this field by um, Clark Chapman and, and Dave Morrison. They published a paper in the early 1990s, and this is how they did it. This is, I actually took this from the uh, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It works the same way in that business. Um, so you've got some kind of probability uh, density function. This is the black curve here. Um, for climate change, that's climate sensitivity. How warm will the earth get for a given amount of uh, CO2 increase? Um, for this, I can plot something that looks very much the same by posing the question, what is the biggest uh, asteroid that's expected to hit the earth in some interval of time, say one decade? Um, that's peaked because the small ones have, a, have some that are bigger and the big ones don't have any that are bigger, so there's a long tail. So it's, it's, it's possible but very unlikely that there's something out here on the long tail that's very big that hits in an interval of time. 
Now, um, there's also a consequence curve. That's the one in red. Um, uh, Chapman and Morrison assumed that there would be some global catastrophe threshold. Um, and, and there's a strong argument that also that it's upwardly concave as you increase the size of the event. Um, there are, there are, it's not just uh, a physical effects that causes the cost in terms of death or in terms of dollars. There's some kind of amplifying effect. But then there's a big jump when you get some kind of uh, cascading effect, either um, due to a uh, nuclear winter type effect or a collapse of agriculture, collapse of uh, ecosystems, collapse of civilization. We don't know where that is. So we have to make a lot of assumptions in this red curve. But then you multiply the red curve by the black curve or by a probability, really, the, uh, if you do probability, it continues on up to the left, except those ones that continue on up to the left don't have any consequence. So really, we're focused on this tail. And you can see that when you multiply those and integrate under the curve, you're dominated by the big ones. You're dominated by what's above that threshold. Um, so I'm going to show, towards the end of the talk, I'm going to show just the right-hand part of that. And I'm going to show it on a, on a different scale. But I wanted to get you oriented to, so that everyone understands how, how I've done this. Uh, now, we've seen this uh, plot. I don't think I have to go into detail about what it is. Um, this is uh, Al Harris's previous population. Um, and, and, and the power law fit through that. Um, power law going all the way from the, the object that wiped out the dinosaurs down here to the bolides based on the, um, the, the graph, the, the map I showed you in my very first slide. Peter Brown uh, had done a study and, and um, up here um, has a point with, with some pretty big error bars. And this was with only eight years of data. This was published in 2002. Um, and, and the blue dash curve is basically just a linear extrapolation in this log-log plane. But the uh, optical observations published by Harris um, several years ago was significantly below that, uh, as much as an order of magnitude below that. Remember, this is a power law plot. So if you ask, um, you know, back, back when this was published, when we thought uh, um, Tunguska was a 15 megaton event, that made it a, a thousand year event, possibly, if, if we just put it right on the power law distribution. But if we used Al's distribution, it would have made it a 10,000 year event or so. Very, very rare event. Um, I up, uh, downgraded the size to five megatons. That put it back at, 100, uh, at a one in a thousand year event. Um, but if, if it were on the power law, it would be a one in 300 year event. It's still an outlier, but not a ridiculous outlier. Um, if you plot it as a one in 100 year event, since it was observed in approximately the last 100 years, it's, you can see where the outlier is. So um, Peter Brown and others published a paper after Chelyabinsk and made a few points. And that is that because Chelyabinsk um, happened, uh, combined with Tunguska and another event in 1963, it appeared that the observations of bolides suggest a much higher flux than what the optical surveys suggested. So we've revisited that. Al has revisited this, and he gave his presentation earlier in the week and described in detail um, why he has increased his, his flux rate. And here's, here's the paper, here's the figure from our uh, 2013 Chelyabinsk paper. And here are the three, wish I could move this cursor better. OK, here are the three outliers. This is Chelyabinsk. This is the um, 1963 observation from infra infrasound. And this is Tunguska with big air bars that account for the fact that we really don't know the yield that well. Um, here they are on that expanded scale. Um, what we have realized now is that the estimate of Chelyabinsk published by uh, the, the frequency estimate published by Brown of Chelyabinsk and the frequency estimate published by Silber for the, what we call the Marion Island 1963 event are grossly high and too high. And that is because they assumed an observation window that is smaller than is realistic for these single big events. They would have been observed even if the observation window for infrasound uh, you know, ha ha had been even shorter. They would have been observed 
uh, otherwise, and Chelyabinsk likewise, if it had ha happened uh, in, over a period of time of more than 50 years, it, almost anywhere on the planet, it would have been observed, not just in that 20-year uh, observation window of bolides. Uh, so now we think Tunguska, if we put it down, these, these blue circles are Al's uh, latest estimate, and so if we, if we drop that down, uh, point to where it would plot if it had occurred at the, at the actual frequency, um, it would be a 500-year event. It's still an outlier, but it's no longer a ridiculous outlier. So finally, this is that little portion of the plot um, that I drew in the very beginning. This is that probability. Um, this is the green curve is the consequence curve, and the cyan curve is the uh, is the product of that. To take the area under the curve. Originally, before any discoveries were made, we had about 1,400 uh, 1, fatalities per year. I carry a lot of extra digits just for inner comparison. Those aren't actually significant. Um, this is based on the current survey results, this current discovery. Um, it's dropped by an order of magnitude. And once the Georgie Brown survey is complete, it will drop down to 36 a year, dominated down here uh, by airbursts. And so I will let you read the conclusions because as co-chair, I don't want to go over my time limit. I want to set a good example. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yeah, the, uh, the Brown et al. paper had a probability, a cumulative probability of impact for the Chelyabinsk size impactors of 0.1 per year, approximately. You said that was overestimated. Uh, what is the new, the best estimate of the probability for the Chelyabinsk size impactors? Um, it works out to about one every 50 years, so that I guess would be 0 0.02. Per year. So dropped it by a factor of five yeah, from the brown at all. Yeah, and that is really because of, the, of this 20-year bolide observation window, and, and really because it's the, it's the big one that would have been observed even if we didn't have these U.S. government sensors. It most likely would have been observed, and so really you, you can't limit it to that window when you do that estimate for these large, low, you know, statistically uh, small, you know, small st numbers. <laughs> Statistics of small numbers, you know, are on the edge of that, and so it's really not an appropriate way to handle the statistics. Yeah, the, uh, Peter's estimate came down, and my population estimate came up until they're in virtually perfect agreement, and that's why we're both co-authors. You see, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we're in complete agreement. Oh, yeah. Finally, something I can understand from emergency management. <laughs> uh, from, a, a, from a risk standpoint, is the, is the, uh, is the consequence curve uh, completely tied to deaths alone? Are they indirect deaths alone? And was there any consideration of cascading uh, impacts from the loss of se uh, infrastructure sectors? I, I, I based the consequence curve on what Chapman and Morrison did, and, and so, you know, it, it is very heuristic. I mean, they assumed that above this global catastrophe threshold, as I recall, a quarter of the Earth's population would die by some effect. But it's, it's, it's you know, we don't, have, we don't have any experiment experiments. We can't really validate that. But it's a reasonable um, estimate, I think. But it, it's good for inner comparison. It's probably not good for absolute numbers. It's good for estimates, and it's good for inner comparison.